one. Where Usha Lee McFarling sends this report on how global warming is affecting the behavior of polar bears, and creating problems for the town of Churchill, which depends on the bears for tourism. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. This week's Our World program comes from Canada, where Usha Lee McFarling sends this report on how global warming is affecting the behavior of polar bears and creating problems for the town of Churchill, which depends on the bears for tourism. The Hudson Bay polar bears are an unusual group. They spend half their year living on the frozen sea ice, and in a normal year, around springtime, when the weather gets warmer, the bears move on to land as the sea ice begins to melt. Once they have done this, their lives enter a new phase, which involves a change in their metabolism. They don't hibernate, but their bodies slow down because they won't eat for the next six months. During this half of the year, they lose hundreds of pounds in weight. Each autumn, as the temperature falls, the bears migrate past the small town of Churchill, waiting for the Hudson Bay to freeze over again. When it has, the bears go back onto the sea ice. Now they can build up their fat reserves by feeding on seals. They survive because the surface of the Hudson Bay is normally frozen from mid-October through to mid-April. During these months, the bears sleep on ice floes and swim in the frigid waters. Normally, that means millions of dollars for the town of Churchill, which earns money by taking tourists into the tundra to see the bears as they pass by the town. However, recently the weather has been warmer and the bears' behavior has changed. The warm weather prevents the sea from freezing, and so the hungry bears come into town looking for food. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. The town of Churchill has good reason to look after the bears. Rough estimates indicate the province of Manitoba earns in the region of three hundred million dollars each year from bear tourism. Bears are the backbone of our economy," said town manager Darren Ottaway. While Ottawa is concerned about an abundance of hungry bears coming to town in the short term, he is even more worried that global warming may mean no bears here at all one day. For three weeks during bear season, Sleepy Churchill blooms as about fifteen thousand tourists stream through town, hoping to get close-up views of the animals from caravans of heated tundra buggies. Several chartered jets unload bear gazers at the Churchill Airport each day. Hotels and restaurants closed during the bleak winter fill to capacity. Polar bears are not currently an endangered species. Their total population is estimated to be from twenty-two thousand to twenty-seven thousand, but the twelve hundred Hudson Bay bears could face what scientists call a local extinction. They could produce fewer cubs. And eventually die out. Officials and business leaders in Churchill have already begun planning for alternative ways of generating income. Ottawa is promoting whale watching and is delighted that Japanese tourists are willing to brave the bone-chilling cold of winter to view the Northern Lights. It's super news for us, Ottawa said of the potential Japanese tourist boom. Warmer weather, Ottaway said, could also extend the shipping season on Hudson Bay and attract more filmmakers. 
The science fiction classic Iceman was filmed nearby, as well as an upcoming film, The Snow Walker. When people talk about climate change, you have to look at the benefits too, Ottaway said. Others, however, feel differently. The bears have been in our community for years, said one resident. They're like neighbors, and everybody ought to be helping to make sure their natural life cycle can be maintained. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a man giving some information about transport in London. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hello, can I help you? Oh, yes. I was wondering what the best way was for me to get around London. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. As you probably realise, the main ways to get around are bus, train and tube. Oh? The underground. Oh. It depends how much you want to spend. Mm. All forms of transport offer special tickets, such as cheap day returns on the trains and so on. Overall, you'll spend less on the bus as it operates on a basic flat fare for each journey. Mm -hmm. But of course, it may not go to where you need to travel to. Oh. The mainline trains only operate in the outlying areas, though a few cross London, whereas the Tube has stations which are placed in central areas of the city, close to the main sites and shops. Mm. Obviously, there are more bus stops... Uh, but you will probably have to change buses to get where you want, which can be inconvenient. <sighs> you will find that the buses are mainly in the central areas, but some tube lines go quite a long way out of London, so you could use this for longer journeys. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the tubes do get very crowded, so you should use the train if you want to sit down. <sighs> it does depend where you're travelling to. Well, I'm living on the outskirts, but I have to travel into London to college every day and then around London when I'm here. Mm. OK, so time is going to be an issue for you. Mm. The Tube should be fast crossing London, but quite honestly, there are so many delays that it's not very efficient. Again, the train has fewer stops, so is probably your quickest option to get to and from college. Huh. Of course, which service you use might depend on how frequent it is. I mean, the trains might only be every 20 minutes or whatever, but a timetable is published to save you hanging around. Oh. There are a lot of tube trains at busy times of day, but fewer at other times whereas the buses run every five minutes through most of the day, and there are night buses. But you'll need to check out your route first. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. OK, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney, then?
Right. Well, you can choose.、Uh, we're here at the information office. Okay.、Uh, now, next to us on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street is the bus stop opposite the bank. Ah.、Uh-huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages.、Uh. If you want to take the train, walk down the High Street towards the city, go past the bank, and on your left is the station. Just、mm-hmm. before you get to the post office,、mm. there's a mainline service to Hackney Wick. So if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there.、Mm. Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first.、Huh. To get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the high street, then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right, opposite the cinema.、Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi, <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Listen to each speaker say more about each invention and complete the tasks. Choose five answers from A to H. Which of these statements about boomerangs does the speaker make? First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Most people probably don't realise what a clever thing a boomerang is. People think they're just toys or something used for sport. In fact, they were the very first objects made by human beings that were heavier than air and could fly. They were used for weapons and for hunting. The oldest Aboriginal boomerangs date back to ten thousand years ago. At that time, they would have been very advanced in terms of technology. The remains of boomerangs have been found in North Africa, India, and parts of America, but it's the Aboriginal boomerang that everyone knows about. When it's thrown correctly, it follows a curved path and comes back to where it was thrown from. Some boomerangs are only about ten centimeters long, but the biggest can be over two meters. Not all boomerangs are designed to come back to the thrower. Hunting boomerangs, some of which are still used by Aborigines in Australia, are designed as flat throwing sticks and are used for hunting. These boomerangs that followed a straight path and flew very fast were actually more difficult to make. And it could be that the famous returning boomerang was actually invented by accident, as attempts were made to develop a faster hunting weapon. Nowadays, boomerangs are made mainly for tourists. It can be quite difficult to learn to throw one so that it comes back to you, and you may need a few lessons before you can do it properly. Part two. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Of course, it's not really clear who exactly invented the television. A number of different scientists and inventors were working on similar projects at the same time. But a man from my country, John Logie Baird, is the man who created the first working television system. He first demonstrated his invention to the public in 1925. At one of London's most famous department stores, Logie Baird demonstrated how silhouette images could be seen to move on a screen. In 1926, he demonstrated his invention again this time at his laboratory to the Royal Institute and to reporters from the Times newspaper. The quality of the projected image had improved greatly and the event is considered to be the first real demonstration of a television system. In 1928, Logie Baird developed his invention and demonstrated the first transmission in colour. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to listen to a student, Liz, giving a seminar presentation on advertising. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, Liz is going to give her presentation. Liz? For my presentation, I looked at the different forms of advertising, especially at how women are portrayed by the media. So, Liz, tell us what different forms of advertising you looked at. As you can see from the outline on the screen, I looked at a wide variety of different medias, including billboards, television ads, newspapers and, of course, the internet. Oh yes, I almost forgot. I also looked at films. And what was your main finding? Well, I've brought some samples in to show everyone, which I hope will make it a little clearer. But first of all, I'd like to take a look at this first advert, which is from, believe it or not, a popular women's magazine. Now, even though this is a women's magazine, as you can see, Women are portrayed in what we might call a submissive role. That is to say, they are always the ones doing the housework, going shopping or caring for the baby. In fact, you may notice that most adverts concerned with household products, such as cleaning materials, as well as food and baby items, are generally directed at women. Another thing you may notice about the women is that they are nearly always very slim and beautiful, even middle-aged women. 
None of them are ever shown to be poorly dressed or to be overweight. So, Liz, how are men normally portrayed in these adverts? Well, if you take a look at the next picture, which is in fact from the same magazine, you will notice that men are seen to be strong, powerful, and in charge. They give the image of being in charge, being the ones who make the decisions. And generally, they are dressed either in sports clothes, showing their prowess or fitness, or a business suit, which serves to depict their social status. You mentioned that you also looked at films. Do these same images apply to the movie industry? Yes, they do indeed. And again, I have some images to show you. This time, however, I've arranged the pictures so that you can see clearly the different roles that men and women play in the films. Notice first of all that it is the man who is in charge. He's the one driving a big luxurious car and constantly contacting the office on his mobile phone. Now, if we look over here to the woman, we see she is subservient to the man. She's his secretary, in fact. And if we take a look at her office, we see it's shared by other women and open to the public. In contrast, her boss's office, who is the man, of course, has a very large, spacious office all to himself. And if the woman wants to enter, she first has to get his permission. That is to say, she has to first of all knock at the door and wait until he invites her to enter. However, if the man wants to talk to the woman, he simply picks up the phone and requests her attention. Are there any images where women are not shown to be of a lower social status to men? No, there aren't. Well, very few, in fact. There are, of course, times when the woman, for example, is playing the part of a scientist with a man as her assistant. Yet even here, she is not in a position to make decisions. Decisions, in fact, are still made by her boss, who, of course, is a man. In other less extreme conditions, such as we can see here, the woman is playing the role of a housewife and mother, while her husband goes out to work to earn the money. In other words, the man is seen to have more control over the situation than the woman, who has to rely upon her husband for her livelihood. So, how far do you think this reflects real life? That's hard to say because generally women do tend to do more housework and cooking than men. It is generally accepted that women are better able to care for children, but the problem is that we are told through the media that women are not as capable or as strong as men, that women are not as able as men to make important decisions. This, of course, is totally untrue. Many women are at least as capable as men at making decisions. More so in some cases. Are women ever seen in the media to be superior to men? Very rarely, in fact. And when they are seen to be better, or faster, or stronger than men, they are also seen to be a freak. You know, someone with superhuman powers. In other words, they are not seen to be an ordinary person like you or me. Why do you think that is? It's probably because if people know it's too ridiculous to be true, then they are not going to believe it. This way, it won't harm men's image. So, what's the internet like? In fact, I think the internet is probably the worst of all the media. I don't know why exactly, but I think it's probably because there is little or no control over the internet. Instead, the internet is seen as a type of no man's land, if you like. That is to say. It's not actually owned by one person or one company. Therefore, people are free to put whatever information on the internet they want. So, would you say that information on the internet should be censored? I think there should be some control over the internet because some of the images are dangerous. Dangerous? Yes, indeed. For adults, I guess it's not such a big problem because mature people are able to decide for themselves what to believe and what not to believe. But children are a different matter. They accept information that is presented to them without questioning that information or considering the consequences of believing it. In other words, children believe what they see or what they are told. And how do、uh, other people feel about information on the internet? Actually, I carried out a survey to find out other people's opinions. As you can see from this chart, 
the majority of people over the age of 28 were in favour of restricting the information. It was only people under the age of 20 who really thought that information shouldn't be censored. In fact, only about 8% said that information on the internet should be restricted in some way. Well, thank you, Liz. That was a very interesting topic. And I'm sure that if any of you have any questions, Liz would be more than happy to answer them. That is the end of part four.